Uh, last week we saw um, uh, God's creation of the world. And so now we're going to be looking at the creation of Adam and Eve, the creation of man. And uh, we will start at verse number 26 of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him, male and female created He them. You know, if we would step back and we would look at how God does this, this is a marvelous thing. This is a miracle to create man out of nothing, really. Uh, you know, David said in Psalm 139, verse 14, he said he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And, uh, and I think David, you know, you know, King David, and again, I, I can't stay anywhere any, any lengthy amount of time, but King David he took the time to meditate. And you know, Eastern religion will make that sound like something weird and mystical. And it is for them. But for us, meditation is simply, we're think for, for a Christian, it's thinking on God. It's meditating, it's thinking on, and it's pondering. It's, and maybe it's praying and also just meditating on the Word of God and the things that God has done. It's nothing mystical or weird. It's, it's simply... Taking time, you know, we're in, a, we're in a world today, in the last hundred years, really, from the time of the Industrial Revolution, and, and don't get me wrong, that's a great thing, it's a miraculous thing that God allowed man to do all those things, but we have, technology has taken us so far to where we don't have a quiet time. We've got stuff stuck in our ears, we've got things ringing on our sides, we've got billboards out in front of us. We've got cars that entertain us and take us where we want to go. And we've lost just to sit for a few minutes, even if it's 15 minutes. We are to a point where we don't think on God. You know, one of the blessed things of living out in the country and not living in the city is you go out at night, you look up and there's stars filling the sky. You look out and you see nature and you see what God has created. You're stuck in the, in the concrete jungle, as they call it, all you see is man's ability. But when you're out and you see, and you get to meditate and think on God. David said that he marveled that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think when he did that, he was thinking about Moses' writings in Genesis. I think he was thinking about what God had done. And then he looked around and he looked at, look, I, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, we know that Psalm 8.5 tells us that we were made a little lower than the angels. There's a difference. But here's the difference. We're made in the image of God. Right. And that's what we're going to look at. And then we're going on, on to chapter 2. So we see God's original plan. And that's what we're kind of, kind, of, kind of focus on this morning. Is God had an original plan for man. And it was a wonderful plan. In Genesis chapter 1 verse number 26. Again we see. And God said let us make man in our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air. And over the cattle. And over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And it's interesting. I just mentioned something in passing last week about 26. If you look at 26 and 27. If there's any argument who God is talking to. 27 really gives you the answer. It says, so God, may, God created man in His own image, in the image of God. So, he's, do you understand that the Trinity is talking to itself? Do you see that? God made man in His image. Now, we're not God. And, but somehow, some way, before man fell, He was created, and, we're, and, we're, and then we're made in, in the likeness of Adam... But we're still a copy of that. So there's still a similarity. There's still something there. God has an ability of things that man doesn't have. But we're made in the image of God. Now God's plan here we see is very, is very straightforward to some degree. And in other ways it's, it's different. Notice that an image. An image. So it says we're made in, our, in, in His image. Image emphasizes the idea of a form. You ever, um, you ever think about a shadow? You ever think about... You know, even, and we understand that there are images that are worshipped and stuff, but we under, also understand that there are statues dedicated for historical events. And you, that's not the person. 
I, I believe if it's not been taken down, there's uh, outside of uh, one of the public buildings in New York City, there's a, there's a statue with Teddy Roosevelt on horse. That's not Teddy Roosevelt. But it's an image of Teddy Roosevelt. It's a likeness. It's, a, it, it's close. You know, you have his features. You have, his, you, you, you have him on horseback. And you would have found him on horseback going up San Juan Hill, right? So he, it, we're ma it's made in the image. He, it's been crafted in the image of Teddy Roosevelt. So you see an image is a representation of the appearance or shape of something. That's not him, but it is a, it's a likeness. Now, we see that God is a spirit. John 4.24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. That's Jesus Christ told the woman at the well in Samaria that uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. You see, God is a spirit. That means it does not have a physical shape, but there's a form, a structure that's revealed, and that's revealed in the Trinity. And like manner, we see that man is a three-in-one being. Now, we always say that we're body, soul, and spirit. But if you go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, the Bible says that we are a spirit, soul, and a body. You see, the spirit, and we covered this a little bit last week, so I don't want to belabor the subject, but the spirit is, uh, is given by God. And when man fell, that spirit died inside. When Adam fell, that spirit died inside of him. At salvation, if you're saved, God quickens that spirit and makes it alive again. And that's where you're able to commune with God's spirit. And now you're a child of God. The soul is the person of who you are. That's the best way I've ever found to describe it. That's who you are without your flesh. This flesh is just a tabernacle. We saw that last week. This body, in fact, we'll see here in just a minute. We see here that the body here, uh, that... He, that the body was made from the dust of the earth, the dust of the ground. God formed man. And that's why the Bible tells us that when you die, that body goes back to the, to the earth that gave it. And you're just going to decay. This body is going to decay. But the soul that's inside of you, that's who you are, will live on forever. And it's either going to go to heaven or hell. The Spirit goes back to God which gave it. That's found in the book of Ecclesiastes. That Spirit goes back to God regardless of whether you're saved or lost. And so, at, but when you're saved, that Spirit's quick and it's made alive. And then you can commune with God again in the way that He wants. And so what a beautiful thing. And so that Spirit, soul, and body is an image of God. Now God's able to somehow... Through, you have God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Somehow, they're one, but they can also act upon independently as well. You say, how does that work? When you find out, you let me know. Because somehow, even to the point of that Christ even stood here on earth when He, was, when he walked here on earth and said, He refers to the Son that's, that's seated at the right hand of the Father. I don't know. But I know that I know the one that did it all. And so we see that man lost that image. That image when Adam sinned and now that dead spirit is still inside of every man, woman, and child unless you're saved. When you're saved, that spirit is quickened. Quickened means made alive. You ever, uh, you ever been trimming your fingernails? You don't hear it much, but... If you're around here and maybe from other places, if you, you cut down too far, you say, I got down to the quick. That's where the life is. Wow, that hurt. But notice this likeness. It said, he says here, after our likeness. Well, likeness emphasizes the idea of nature. That is, that likeness means the same general characteristics. That is, it's the gener same things. So, you understand there's vast differences between God and man. And there are also likeness Likenesses that position man above the nature of animals. And man, and, and, and see, man is capable of fellowship with God where animals don't have that. Do you understand that man, unlike animals, is self conscious? You say, well, well of course. I mean, you're self conscious right now. You're thinking about, hey, I, I got up this morning, I, I, you know, I, I got dressed, I want to make sure, you know, I, I bathed last night. Or this morning, I, I combed hair, I got ready. You're self-conscious. How do I look? 
Well, it's not just that. It's I'm conscious of my surroundings. Am I hot? Am I cold? Am I, hey, does this feel good? Does this not feel good? You're self-conscious. You consider yourself in a subject as the, as the person in that subject. You think about You run scenarios in your mind. You ever had to go and, and have an interview and say, well, let me, let me think about it. Well, if they say this, and I'm going to say that. And then, you know, I need to make sure things look right. And I'm going to make sure, hey, I, I, this resume's filled out. Or you're looking for a job. You're self-conscious about what's going to... Animals don't think about that. It's king of the jungle. It's, hey, it, lion is the king, king of the field. Right? You're also, you reason. I kind of hit on that already, but man can understand, judge, imagine, work on a topic. Man can, they're, 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 in, in business and even in, even in leadership, sometimes there's books that are written, talks about this, it's called a paradigm shift where you actually pull yourself out of the situation, you get out of the box, and you look in the box. Man can do that. Animals don't do that. But man can. See, that's kind of the likeness of God. Because God can look down and look at the whole situation and He knows the end from the beginning. Now, we don't know the end from the beginning, but we can play scenario. See the likeness? See, man's superior to the animal. In fact, God just spoke and He made creatures, but He didn't breathe in Him the breath of life. See, that's that spirit. And that's how man became, uh, has an eternity. See, the spirit of, of an animal, Ecclesiastes, goes back to the ground. It doesn't have an eternal life like man does. Fourth, we see that morality, we see, uh, we see language. I know animals can make noises and clicks, and they have some form of communication. I, and I've got to wonder sometimes if God understands their communication to some degree, because they give glory to God somehow. But they don't have a language system like man does. And, you know, God confounded the languages later at the Tower of Babel and made hundreds more, right? Man has language. We can learn a new language. we got some in our midst that know at least two or more. That's man. And you also have morality. You see, man's, man has the ability to understand and act on right and wrong. In fact, man can be on the road to the wrong and decide, I need to do right. Animal doesn't do that. Again, it's the fittest. But do you understand that when man loses his way and is educated out of knowing God, what does he do? He acts just like the animal. Because he has no sense of right and wrong because he's lost that sense of right and wrong. God has put in man right and wrong. Romans talks about that. Roman talks about, Romans talks about that God has put even, that even the natural man, when he, act, when, he, when he acts the way he does, and there's a sense of right and wrong, he shows that there is a creator. You understand that? God has made that. God has put that in every man. There's a conscience, and it's only when man burns that conscience and he takes away that, the, the childlike faith and, and educates it out of that young person that they start acting like an animal. Now, verse number 7. Uh, go back to chapter 2 now. Excuse me, chapter number 2. And let's look at, uh, let's look at verse number 1 here. Verse number 1. Actually, look, look at verse number 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew... For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now the understanding here is if you look, and we've already kind of touched upon this, so it won't take, it, take very long here. We see here the body. The body came from the dust of the ground. Remember I said that when, the, when a person dies... The body goes back to the ground that gave it. Because that's where God took it from. You see the soul, notice there, verse number 7, man became a living soul. But you also see the indication of the Spirit. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But notice here what God gives man. This is the, again, this is God's creation. This is what God's original intent was for man. 
God creates man here, verse number 4. Verse number 7, we see His creation. And then look at verse number 8 now. Verse number 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four beds. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedlam and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same as that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hadekel, that is which goeth toward the east, east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Notice here that God formed man, and he, then he, he breathed in his nostril the breath of life, and he became a living son, he places him there in the garden. Now, another thing just to point out is that best we can understand from Scripture, rain did not fall on the earth until after Noah's flood. Until at Noah's flood. It had never rained. You do the math, and again, all this is, you know, sometimes we're, you know, maybe we're approximate, but about 1,600 years. Till Noah and Noah's in the flood there, so there it seemed that there were in up a mist from the earth to water the whole face of the ground, and this type of thing. If if you're into science, you're going to like this. If not, you'll check out for one minute, and we'll keep going. But it would seem that this would have given a, a, a almost a greenhouse effect, where it would have been very moist. It would have been a different environment entirely. Um, you know, some have said, was that reason why man lived so long? I, that could have been, but also God, keep in mind, God was, God was multiplying the earth. Man had to live a while. I mean, you think about it. So I think between God's ability to just lengthen man's life, but right after, you see, even Abraham, his life was shorter. They started getting shorter in life. Before that, before Noah's flood, it was very lengthy. Could it have been part of that? Yes, but it could also just mean simply God was giving man a longer life. Okay? Now, we see this garden. And the garden is the garden in Eden. It's, Eden seems to be a bigger place. Some have said, well, where was this? Well, here's our problem. We get an indication from the Word of God, but only two rivers are really identifiable today. And that's if they still have the same path that they had then. Because remember, the flood would have changed a lot of things. Some of these rivers, we have no idea where they were. They're no longer in existence. And I'll just read some of our notes here. You see, there are four rivers, or four parts of the river, into one river that flowed out of Eden. The two rivers that can still be identified as Euphrates and Hedekel, which is the Tigris River today. And I just, just went on Google Earth and was just looking at it. And here's the interesting thing. If... And only if the Tigris and the Euphrates still have the same place where they join. This means that the garden in Eden would have been around where Iraq is today. Say, so that is a dusty, lifeless, well not lifeless, desert isn't always lifeless, folks, but that is a dusty wasteland. I know. But apparently, it was not always like that. Is remember, the flood would have changed geography tremendously. The other thing that you see here is, and everybody wants to know where the Pison was. You know why they want to know? Well, look at your Bible. Well, the Pison is that which encompasseth the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And so greedy. Well, if we can find where that is, we have it made. Good luck. Because we don't know where it's at. But it's interesting because... A couple of these rivers here, the Pison and the land of Havilah are impossible to identify. Some have placed it at this location all the way in India, while others in Arabia. The source of the Euphrates and the Tigris are close to one another, and perhaps the area that was original to where uh, the Garden in Eden would have been. The other that we see is that the other river that's mentioned here, uh, there is, doesn't work because um, now you have the Nile uh, in that area. And so it doesn't work. So again, this, the flood changed a lot of things geographically. 
and it's hard to identify. Now, notice the responsibility of man here, what God does for Adam, what God has for Adam. Notice in verse number 28 now, or excuse me, verse number, we go back, look at verse 28 of chapter 1, because I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, and then we're going to jump back over. But notice verse 28, and then we're going back and read verses 15 through 17. Verse 28 of chapter 1, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now look at verse 15 of chapter 2. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the, gar- into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, do you know that man from the start had a commission on his life? Say, see, this, is, this is interesting. This is also the other thing that, that typical, typical Christianity will get. Well, I'm just going to go to heaven and pluck a heart. No, you're not. Because even at the start, God had work for man. But here's the difference. God put man in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Do you understand that good hard work is actually a blessing from God? Listen, gentlemen, have you ever worked on something, whether it's a vehicle or maybe you, you weld or you do something else and you, get, you step back and go, wow, I like what I was able to create today. I was able to work on and accomplish. That's a gift from God. Do you understand that God puts in man to actually want a desire to to build something and to do better and to create something better than the last and and make things stronger and better. There's nothing wrong with that. God's put that in man to innovate. And it's a gift from God. What is the curse, and we'll not look at this this week, but next week and later lessons, is it's the hardship from the work. It's the pain that comes from it. It's the tiring of the body. It's the harm that it does to the body. That's the curse, because that will be the sweat that you now are going to have to endure. But the work is a gift from God. It's the frustrated result. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine a world Adam had where every time he worked on something, it turned out right? Now we have, you know, Edison was at 900 and some tries, forgive me if I'm wrong, that he tried with the light bulb, and And they said, well, aren't you upset? No, I just now know 900 and so many ways it didn't work. That was the positive outlook. Many of us would go, forget it. (laughs) That's the frustration of the work. It's those results from that labor. But you know what? I said a moment ago, God has a plan that even in eternity, we'll be doing something for Him. Revelation chapter number 22, verse number 3 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. That's God's plan. That's what God always wanted. You say, well, do I want to serve Him? You do if you love Him. You do if you love Him. Now notice too, we see this restriction here on, these, on this tree. And this is something else I want to be sure to clear up. Back in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I, don't know, I think there's been some misunderstanding over the years that Adam and Eve were allowed to eat of the tree of life. It was of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they were not supposed to eat. Now, we won't deal with this today, but when God said that the day in which thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die, they did. They said, well, they didn't kill over. No. They died spiritually. Remember, I was talked about how that the Spirit was in Adam. That Spirit died in Adam that very day. They understood now their sin that just, that just happened. And so, God had to make a way for man to be saved. But notice this tree of life was there for them to eat. And we'll talk more about why that tree was there and how that tree will be in eternity later at a different lesson. You know, God wants us to love and serve Him of our own free will. We say, well, why would God, why would God put a tree in a garden just so Adam and Eve could fall? 
That's kind of wrong. Okay, do you want your dad while you were growing up to never let you try to do anything on your own and do right or wrong? You say, well, that's God. Well, God was the father of Adam. He did not want Adam and Eve to serve him like a robot. Do you want to do something just because you're told to do it and never get a chance to have input? You say, well, that's different. No, it's the same. Because here's why. If Adam and Eve never had a chance to fall, they would have never had a chance to say, I choose you, God, over this. And that's why even today, and it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a second point, but even today, God gives men. You say, well, God could just come and save every man. He could. But then man doesn't get to choose between God or the devil. God wants you to choose Him because you want to choose Him and love Him. Now, this garden, this home, wouldn't be complete without another individual, would it? All right. Verse number 18. The Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground of the Lord and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And once sort of Adam called every living creature, that was the name there. Now notice. This did not surprise God. God already had in His plan to make the woman. But He held back for a minute. In a way, God was kind of leading Adam here. Notice here it says, And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man and made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, notice some things here. Again, this isn't nothing, there's no revelation here, but some interesting things. This problem shows itself upon the occasion of the name of the animals. We've already covered that. Adam sees, and God already knows, but Adam needs a companion. You know, a help me to someone that's there beside you. Adam needed a companion to keep him from being alone. Adam needed a comforter to help him in the day-to-day life. Adam needed a compliment to round about his character that was meat for him. But a meat, the word meat, M-E-E-T, means ready, prepared, just right. Do you know what your wife is? She's just right for you. And that's what a help meet is supposed to be. Now, this creation of, of the woman, the Lord did the first operation in the Bible. You see, He put him to a deep sleep. Huh, what do you know? Anesthesia. Right? Put him to sleep, did the operation, let him wake up. God made the first perfect surgical operation, folks well before man had any of the drugs to do it. God did it. Notice that this one, the woman was taken out of man. That's the indication here that the W-O that comes without, you notice the abbreviation we use, without. Notice here, in fact, the Lord, it, Adam even says, Adam names the woman. Now, not only do we see the first surgical operation, but we also see the institution of marriage. Verse number 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Notice verse 24. Verse 24, You do understand that from the beginning, marriage consisted of a man leaving his family, cleaving unto his wife, that means being with her and becoming one with her. And even unto his wife. That's not plural. You say, well, but then you have, you know, you have Jacob and others that had more. God never intended that. Okay? That from day one, in fact, this can be supported if you, if we don't have time to turn there, but Matthew chapter number 19, Jesus Christ repeats this very verse. In fact, I have it here in front of me. I'm just going to read it for you because we're done. Matthew 19, verse 4 says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read And he's talking to the Pharisees, talking to the Jews around him. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? We already dealt with that. We don't have time to get into that right now. But there are two, not more than two, genders. Matthew 19, 5, And said, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Notice that Jesus Christ, 
in the book of Matthew in the New Testament backed up what Genesis chapter number 2 says. It was never intended for there to be more than one man and wife from the beginning. Uh, This, you know, multiple wives, that has no place. God never intended that. And God always intended for it to be a man and his wife to raise his family. That's the nucleus family. And understand, that's what this world and all the left and everything is fighting against. And the reason they're fighting against it is because it's found right here. Anything that God institutes, the dark side of man and this darkness of this world is going to fight against and buck up against. 